got it going. Okay, so we wanna, um, I wanna give you a little bio for our special guest, Bob Levy, that he sent to me. So I wanna share a little bit of his history. Many of you may already know it. Um, so I'm just gonna go through that and let you know what he's been doing his whole life. So Bob is a prize-winning journalist who has covered the Washington scene since the Johnson administration. For 23 years, he wrote a daily column, Bob Levy's Washington for the Washington Post. The column looked at all aspects of life in the nation's capital. It won major awards from the Society of Professional Journalists and the Washington Journalism Review. Currently, he writes a monthly column for Senior Beacon newspapers. Seven times, Bob Levy was named one of the most popular col columnists in Washington by Washingtonian Magazine for his Post column. Early, earlier in his 36-year career at the Post, Bob covered presidential politics, Congress, local news, and sports. In 1999, Bob Levy was named a Washingtonian of the Year by Washingtonian Magazine in recognition of his community service through his column and as a hands-on volunteer. He has also had an extensive career in electronic media. Over the course of more than 20 years, he worked for nine radio stations, four TV stations, and one popular internet site as a commentator and talk show host. His online chats for WashingtonianPost.com, that's WashingtonPost.com, called Levy Live, won consistently high ratings. Bob was born and raised in New York. He escaped at a tender age to attend the University of Chicago, where he earned a bachelor's degree with special honors in English. He has spoken to college, business, and social groups all over the country. He has taught journalism at six major research universities. In 2000, Washington Post Books published Washington Album, a pictorial history of the nation's capital, a 200-page illustrated history of the local city. Levy co-authored the book with his wife, Jane F. Levy, a historian. Levy is the author of three other books, one a collection of columns, another a look at local Washington, the third his novel, Larry Felder, Candidate, which we're going to hear about tonight. In his spare time, Bob has been a semi-professional folk singer, a union president, and a national champion tournament bridge player. And I read somewhere that you also played softball. Oh yeah. And is that still going on? I played until I was 51 years old. And when I tore my hamstring for the fifth time, I said, that's the end that of myself. So. It. That was it. Um, and he and his wife are the parents of two adult children, Emily and Alexander, and I hear grandchildren through our conversation. Number one. So with that, the first one. So with that, we're going to go ahead and get started. Um, we'll be muting everybody. You can put Bob on speaker view so he shows up um, foremost in your on your screen. There we go. And take it away. Okay, Melissa, thank you so much. And ladies and gentlemen, thank you so much for being here today. Uh, not just because uh, I love to talk about my career and I love to talk about all the stories that I've covered and I have, have starred in, but also because you're my neighbors. And uh, I just was saying to Jane, my wife earlier today, we're coming up on 40 years in Montgomery County. And uh, I know a lot of you must have lived in the county that long or longer. and. Uh, I just want to say to all of you, my neighbors, isn't this just a terrific place to live? I just love it here. And I love it uh, not only because uh, I grew up in the Bronx where uh, your life could come to an end at any moment, uh, but because this county has it all for a guy who's in my life. It has great people, it has great stories, it has great history, it has big problems. And it's got opportunities for community service, which uh, I was telling some of the folks earlier I've been involved in. Uh, I'm in my sixth year as a trustee at Montgomery College. And one of the things that uh, I'm so proud of is that we do so well in attracting students from none other than Poolsville High School. That's the fourth greatest source of students that we have after some of the, the bigger schools downstate, uh, down county. So, uh, I feel as if we're all on the same page here, and uh, I really am delighted at the chance to be with you. 
Just one note about Melissa's introduction. Uh, she is right that I've been covering the Washington scene since the Johnson administration. That is the Lyndon Johnson administration. Uh, <laughs> I, I know I'm old, but uh, Andrew's a little bit before my time, just a little. You know, I sometimes pinch myself because I am now in my 54th consecutive year of working for the Washington Post. Melissa told you I was there full time uh, for 36 years. That is true. And I've been a contract writer ever since. And I'll get back to that in a little while to tell you about what I've been doing for the Post since I left. But before I really get going, I hope that all of you are loaded for bear tonight because once I'm done, I'm gonna open the floor to questions and please feel free to ask anything you like. That means anything. Don't worry about hurting my feelings. Don't worry about embarrassing me. You can't do it. The only thing I can't fix anymore, folks, and I'm sorry about this, is the kind of calls I used to get at the Post all the time from people who said, the guy threw my paper in a puddle this morning and I'm just so mad. And I would call my guy up in circulation and I'd get a fresh dry paper out there within 20 minutes. I can't do it anymore. So if that knucklehead threw your paper in the, in the, in the drink this morning, sorry, just dry it off. All I can do. Whoops. Was that an oops? Okay, well, I'll go on. If that was an oops, sorry, I'll go on anyway. <laughs> I often pinch myself, not just because uh, I've had such an interesting career, but because none of it ever would have happened if I were not the luckiest duck who ever quacked. Now, Melissa told you about me and bridge, uh, that I'm a national champion bridge player. I have nearly 8,000 master points. I have the rank of Emerald Life Master. I teach bridge, I write about bridge, I play bridge. I won a bridge tournament just this afternoon online. A bridge and I go back a long way, but my life at the Washington Post depended on bridge. And let me tell you the story because all of us have been through wild job interviews, right? Good, bad, and indifferent. I think mine at the Post was the craziest. The scene was 1967 and I was finishing one year as a cub reporter on my first newspaper in Albuquerque, New Mexico. And I got the idea that I was ready for the big time. You know, hey, I was all at 22 years old. It's time to go to a much bigger paper. So I wrote a letter to the editor of the Washington Post. You remember letters with a stamp up in the corner? Yeah. And I said, I'd, li I'd like to come east for an interview. And he wrote back a letter with a stamp. And we made a date for a Monday morning. Well, Friday evening comes around and it's time for me to fly. And I'm going around and around and around the Albuquerque airport and I cannot find a place to park any place. 10 minutes, 15, finally I find a place and I'm running through the airport, 10 minutes to get the flight. And I realize I have nothing to read before a four and a half hour flight. So I pop into the bookstore and there it is, a copy of a book about bridge. East, had a nice weekend in Washington, showed up bright and early for my 9 a.m. Monday morning appointment at the Post. And for all of you who go way, way back in Washington, this is the old, old Washington Post at 1515 L Street Northwest. Well, I'm getting escorted up in the elevator by this young woman and she said, oh, oh, didn't they tell you that Mr. Wiggins isn't the editor of the Post anymore? I said, what? Yeah, over the weekend, President Johnson has named him the ambassador to the United Nations. And there's a new guy in the corner office. I've never heard of him. He's never heard of me. He's taking over Wiggins' appointment. So I said, okay, fine. And the guy sticks his hand out and says, hi, my name is Ben Bradley. In just six years, Bradley will be the most famous newspaper editor in American history. And if you've seen the movie, All the President's Men, folks, I hope you have, Jason Robards Jr. just absolutely nails Bradley in that movie. He's got him. He's, he's alternately your best friend and your, your all business guy. He can just toggle back and forth. So we go into his office and he says, sit down. And he says, how was your flight from Albuquerque? Oh, fine, da, 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 da. 
And then all of a sudden he flicks it on. And I'm gonna do Bradley's voice because he really did talk like this. He looked at me and he said, all right, what's the last book you read? Uh-oh. <laughs> Obviously Bradley, whose family came over on the Mayflower who had gone to Harvard University, wanted me to say David Copperfield or something like that. And I don't know to this day, folks, why I told him the truth, but I looked him in the eye and I said, better bidding in 30 days, Mr. Bradley. And he looked at me and he said, you'll play bridge? I said, yeah, I do. You'll play well? And I said, yeah, I got all these master points. Bradley starts writing on a yellow pad and I cannot see what's on the pad. I'm sure he's gonna hold it up to the window to his secretary. And it's gonna say, get this kid out of here right now. Nope. He finishes and he frisbees the pad at me and it hits me in the gut and I look at the pad. There's a bridge hand written on the pad. And here's Bradley. I was playing with my wife last night and that's her hand. And I opened a bidding with one club and do you believe she bid one diamond with that hand? He was still mad about it the next day. So here with my entire future uh, hanging in the balance, I looked at the hand and I, I too would have bid one diamond with that hand. But I looked at Bradley and I said, oh no, sir, oh no. I, I would have bid one heart with that hand. And then I get 10 minutes of Bradley reminiscing about how he used to fleece the suckers in the dorm at Harvard in the 10 cent a point bridge game. I think he thought I was fast Eddie or somebody, but after 10 minutes of this, he stood up and shook my hand and he said, you've got the job. And so I can go to my grave saying that by sheer chance, I was the first person hired by the legendary Ben Bradley. But that of course was just the beginning. Uh, I sat between Bob Woodward and Carl Bernstein during Watergate. I had a first name friendship with the amazing publisher of the Post, Catherine Graham. And of course, as, uh, as Melissa has told you, I had my own column in the Post for nearly a quarter of a century. It was a great ride and uh, it was a particularly great ride when I look back at all those years and all the people that I worked around. You know, I was at least a generation younger than the big uh, stars on the paper at that time. And I look back at them, particularly the political reporters whom some of you may remember, David Broder, who was the chief political correspondent for many, many years, Haynes Johnson, who won four Pulitzer Prizes, uh, Bill Greider, who only died a few months ago, who often wrote the front page political wrap up stories. These guys were my mentors and my friends and my North Stars. And so a couple of years ago, I said, you know, I really should do a memoir about the Post. But then I thought about it and I said, other people have done memoirs and they're probably much better. What if I tried my hand at a very realistic novel about the two things that I really know and love? Number one, downtown journalism, and number two, Montgomery County, Maryland. And so, ladies and gentlemen, here is the result. Larry Felder Candidate, my book, the story is about a Larry who is a famous columnist for a big Washington newspaper who abandons journalism to run for Congress in Maryland's 8th District, which is in Montgomery County. And a lot of stuff happens to Larry, good, bad, and indifferent. Uh, he's, uh, he runs into the unforeseen, he runs into love, he runs into misfortune. And I'm not gonna tell you how the book ends, but uh, in the end, the good guys win. Let's just put it that way. I know what you're thinking and I know what you're gonna ask me and let me head that one off at the pass. Larry Felder is not me. Uh, I am not running for Congress. I am not running for anything. I am never giving up journalism. I ran for the student council when I was in the seventh grade and I lost and it was so crushing that I've never run for anything again. Now, Larry Felder's journey is a journey through the realistic precincts of Montgomery County. And since all of you live in Montgomery, or I think most of you do, you will see in this book a lot of places and you'll recognize a lot of characters who really ring true, I think. 
there's a scene in this book uh, in downtown Bethesda. That's the first page of the book where Larry is declaring for Congress at a big hotel there. There's an important scene in Potomac, Maryland. There's an equally important scene in a parking lot in Silver Spring. This is a very local book for all of us who live here and love living here. It is also, I think, a very accurate book. Uh, not every novel is accurate. Not every novel tries to be accurate, but this one, I think, really does that. Beside Larry, you will meet a lot of characters who uh, I think you probably know very well or would if they were real. Larry's uh, campaign manager is a much younger woman named Charlie and Charlie keeps him on schedule and keeps him going. And Charlie is uh, Larry's girl Friday. But Charlie would also like to be Larry's girl Monday, girl Tuesday, girl third one, you get the point. And the conflict between Larry and Charlie is all through the book. You will meet the editor of the downtown paper that I so cleverly call the Washington Record. <laughs> it bears no resemblance to the Post. He bears no resemblance to Bradley at all. And uh, this guy's been uh, kind of this uh, tough customer for a long time, but just like Bradley, he really has a heart of gold. You will meet Larry's boyhood buddy from the Grand Concourse in the Bronx, where I spent a good part of my childhood. This guy has gone on to be one of those downtown Washington lawyers with a view out over Lafayette Square, the White House, uh, and the 811 million covers of Washingtonian magazine of him on the cover on the walls. And he's Larry's uh, de facto campaign manager. And then you will meet the young woman who is the record reporter who covers Larry's campaign. And this is one of those uh, young reporters who eats broken glass for breakfast. <laughs> yes, there are plenty of those. And she and Larry also clash in an epic way. Uh, the book has gotten lots of nice notices and lots of uh, lovely reviews. But I think the best one, folks, has come from none other than Congressman Jamie Raskin who represents the 8th District of Maryland. Uh, you've seen Jamie on television just yesterday leading the impeachment. Uh, he's in his third term now. Uh, I've known him since he was 16 years old. That's how old I'm getting. Jamie Raskin said about this book, he said, I'm just glad that I never had to run against either Larry Felder or Bob Levy. <laughs> Thank you, Jamie Raskin. You know, when you write a book about a newspaper columnist and you want to be sure that it's not you, you have to build him in a certain way. And I did that. And so any of you who, who read this book and who are looking for similarities between Larry and me, the big difference I think in this book is that Larry just doesn't get it about that half of the population called women. Early in the book, uh, Larry is uh, a cub reporter on a, on a newspaper in Westchester County, New York, and a young woman on the staff slips him a note one day. And the note says, why don't you come see me on Saturday night, dash, and make no plans for Sunday? And Larry, the nerd, calls her and says, should I bring a jacket and tie? And then later in the book, when Larry is getting going with the woman who becomes his wife, she says to him, Larry, you launch a thousand fires in my tummy. And Larry looks at her and says, would you like a Tums? I haven't been single in a very long time, folks, but I promise you that when I was, I was a lot cooler than that, a lot cooler. So Larry Felder candidate uh, is so accurate. I got to tell one on myself there because I almost stubbed my toe. I was doing a session very much like this, and I was uh, telling the story of uh, Larry's campaign uh, in the middle of the campaign. He lives in Bethesda on Green Tree Road in the book, and one summer night, he decides to take a walk very late at night. And I'm sure you've had this experience in Montgomery. You're kind of padding along in your shorts and your t-shirt and your flip-flops, and it's a summer night, and you can hear the TV sets on and the houses around you and you hear the cicadas and uh, flop, flop, flop. Larry's walking along. And just for no reason, I put in the book this. I said, as Larry walked along, 
a discarded styrofoam coffee cup from the Dunkin' Donuts at Montgomery Mall blew down the street past him. You know, just a little color, right? Well, I was reading that section of the book, guy sticks his hand up and says, Bob, don't you know, there never was a Dunkin' Donuts at Montgomery Mall. Oh my gosh. Oh, Mr. Pat myself on the back about how accurate I am. Uh-oh. I spent one day of my young life on the phone trying to find the guy who developed Montgomery Mall. And I got him. He's 97 years old. <laughs> he lives in Florida. I called him and I explained. He said, Bob, we had a Dunkin' Donuts at Montgomery Mall for one week. <laughs> oh, I can breathe again. Okay, why one week? They didn't pay the rent. Gone. <laughs> so I'm accurate, uh, and I think I can continue to say that I'm accurate. You know, I look back on the people at the Post, and for Bob Woodward and Carl Bernstein, who are now the two most famous journalists who ever lived, it was quite a journey. And I have no regrets about my time at the Post whatsoever. It was great. But the only regret I have is that I am not in the movie. I should be in the movie because I sat right between Bob and Carl. And every day during Watergate, two and a half years of high wire, big time journalism, some of the greatest stories ever reported and written in American life, Every uh, day at about 545, squadrons of editors would come and hover over us and they'd say to Woodward, what do you got today, Woodward, what do you got? And they'd say to Bernstein, what did Nixon say today? What did he say? And there I was in between them, not writing about Watergate. So here's the one line that I should have had in the movie that would have won me best supporting actor for sure, for sure. I turn a little bit to my right and I would say this every day, could you guys please go somewhere else? I'm trying to get some work done here. They never would. You know, I got another shot at this, I have to say, because believe it or not, in a couple of years, it's gonna be 50 years since the Watergate break-in, June 1972, coming up. So there's a lot of gossip that they're gonna make a remake of all the president's men. And so I think I might get my shot this time. Either that or Brad Pitt will play me <laughs> one, one way or the other. You know, Bob and Carl could not have come from uh, more different backgrounds. <clears throat> and the fact that they made such a great team, such a Batman and Robin together is really quite remarkable. Bob was the son of a Republican judge. Uh, he grew up on the North shore of Chicago. He spent all of his spare time at a country club he famously never met an African-American until he was 15 years old. He went uh, right to Yale. He came right out of Yale into the United States Navy. He uh, was assigned actually as a signal corpsman uh, at the White House when he was in the Navy. And uh, so he got a little early taste of the Nixon administration there, but he wanted journalism and he insisted on it. And he now is the man in journalism in America, probably the world. He's just recently come out with his 14th number one best-selling book. He's working on number 15. <clears throat> you know, Bob is now 78 years old and he still works 14 hours a day, every day. That's just Bob. He just does this. Carl Bernstein, on the other hand, went to Melissa Rose's alma mater, Blair High School in Silver Spring. And before he got there, Melissa, he had a very interesting childhood. Both of his parents were members of the Communist Party. And Carl, born in the 1940s, was what was known at the time as a red diaper baby. And communist couples in those days would swaddle the young little love in red diapers, hoping that the kid would also grow up to be a communist one day. Well, Carl didn't grow up to be a communist. Carl grew up to be kind of a scatterbrained, womanizing, freeloading, wild man of the social scene in Washington, DC. And it's really quite amazing that Carl uh, survived long enough at the post to be Carl Bernstein, half of the Watergate duo, because about two months before Watergate, Carl was assigned to cover the mayor of Washington, D.C., and 
Bradley was coming down to have lunch with the mayor one day and it's, you know, lunchtime, one o'clock in the afternoon. There's a big press room up on the upper floor of the district building and Bradley gets off the elevator and he said, I think I'll pop in and see Carl while I, just before I see the mayor. And he goes into the press room one in the afternoon and there's Carl sleeping it off on a couch in the press room. Last night had ended only about an hour earlier. That's Carl. Carl used to go to embassy parties and he would walk in and say, I'm from the Washington Post. And they would say, oh, over here, sir, over here. And he'd have a free dinner and he'd have four free cocktails and then he would leave and never write a word. But the one that almost got Carl fired before he could become Carl Bernstein, about one month before Watergate, he was on an out of town assignment. I think it was in Cleveland. And he went and he filed the story and uh, the story appeared the next day. Nobody thought anything of it. You know, things move very fast at a newspaper. Every day is a new day. One month later, Hertz rent a car at the Cleveland airport calls Bradley. Is Mr. Bernstein planning to return the car he rented here a month ago? <laughs> oh, the meter's been running for one whole month. The tab was up into the hundreds, maybe the thousands, and Bradley was not happy. I hope that some of you have served in the United States Navy so you can check me on this one. Bradley was on a PT boat in the World War II alongside another young Navy officer named John Fitzgerald Kennedy. They got to be big buddies, but Bradley always said that the major thing that he learned in the Navy was how to curse for two consecutive minutes without repeating himself. <laughs> Try it sometime, you can't, you can't. You'll be out of gas after 20 seconds. But I stood there in the newsroom and I listened to Bradley let Carl have it for the whole two minutes of obscenities and the profanities and probably more. And Bradley wanted to fire him on the spot and cooler head said, no, 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 no. And now he belongs to the ages. That's the way it goes sometimes. Catherine Graham, on the other hand, was just as unlikely in some ways as either Bob Woodward or Carl Bernstein. Uh, many of you may know the, the history of the Post, so I'll, I'll just capsulize it for you. The Post was bought in the uh, 1930s by Catherine Graham's father at auction. It was worth almost nothing. <clears throat> as the old joke said, uh, it was the fifth newspaper in a four newspaper town. And in the late 30s, uh, one did not uh, give a newspaper to one's daughter to run. He gave it to the daughter's husband, a man named Philip Graham. And Catherine Graham, his wife, did what wives did in those days. She was a diligent hostess. She had babies, one, two, three, four. She ran dinner parties. She never dreamed for a second that she would work for a living. She didn't have to. Her husband was doing it all. Her husband made the Washington Post uh, what it is today. He continued to build circulation. He merged with the Times Herald. He outlasted the Evening Star and the Daily News. He bought Newsweek magazine. He bought Channel 9. He turned the Post into quite a colossus. And then one day in 1963, he shot himself to death. And suddenly Catherine Graham, his sudden widow had to make a decision about this newspaper. Would she run it? Would she sell it? Would she run it with help? What would she do? She had never done anything. She decided to run the paper and the rest you know. She turned out to be one of the most successful, if not the most successful publisher who ever lived. She not only stood up to the Nixon administration twice, once in Watergate and once slightly before, in the Pentagon Papers dispute, but she built the post into one of the most successful companies in America. It was at the time she stepped down one of the hundred most profitable companies in the world. And that is in a community, as all of us know, that is nowhere near as big as the New Yorks and the Chicago's and the Los Angeles. Now, how did she do this? Well, Catherine Graham had a kind of determination that very few have but she also had a sweetness about her that I will never forget. And I wanna tell you these two stories about Catherine Graham because I think they'll illustrate the two sides of her. 
All of you have been around a long time will probably remember a little over 30 years ago, Giant Food was running a promotion where you could put together your grocery receipts and bring them into your local Giant and they'd give you uh, computer equipment for your kid's school. Remember that? They did this for several years and it wasn't a big deal. You know, you'd, you and your neighbors would get some receipts together. You get a mouse or something for your kid's elementary school. And that was that. Well, at the time, <clears throat> uh, Giant Food was by a long way the uh, biggest advertiser in the post. $160 million a year. That's a lot of money. And uh, it wasn't quite that you didn't mess with Giant if you were working in the newsroom, but you didn't want to do anything stupid either. So one year, uh, <clears throat> as Giant was doing this again, I got a brilliant idea. I said, Levy, you have a million readers a day. Why don't you ask them to send you their receipts? And then you, Mr. Wonderful, can bundle all of these receipts together and you find some school in Southeast Washington that would never have any way of participating in this. And they can have not just a mouse, but a whole computer lab. And so I did this for three, four years. And I think it's a measure of how big a, a deal the post was in 1990 or so. Uh, that in a couple of those years, I collected more than $20 million worth of receipts just by writing about it. Quite amazing. That didn't mean, by the way, $20 million worth of computer equipment, not even close, but it was a lot and we were doing well. And I got, was getting set to do this for another year and one day my phone rings and it's a guy I don't know. And he identifies himself as some vice president of Giant Food and he starts screaming at me. Bob Levy, you have to stop doing this right this minute. Bob Levy, don't you know that we spent $160 million on your newspaper? Bob Levy, do you want me to call Catherine Graham and get her to tell you to stop doing this? Bob Levy, don't you know that the whole point of this, the, this campaign was that no one would ever redeem these receipts? Surely you understand that. Well, I don't know who hung up on whom first. Uh, it was probably about a tie, <clears throat> but I remember putting the receiver down and thinking, Robert, you are in trouble. Well, not six minutes later, the phone rings again and I, I sort of knew who it would be. And I pick it up and here's this woman with a very deep, distinctive voice. Bob, it's Kay. Bob, what's this about giant food, said Mrs. Graham. <clears throat> Excuse me. Well, I told her the story and she said, Bob, I'll take care of it. And I never heard another word. Catherine Graham stood up to a $160 million advertiser on behalf of one guy writing one column just because she thought it was the right thing to do. My gosh. She always said, my job is to build the sandbox and put sand in it, and then you guys get to play. Well, indeed. But she certainly backed us uh, in when we needed backing, and uh, I will never forget that. Nor will I ever forget this, folks, because Catherine Graham had a heart that so many people say doesn't exist in corporate America. In uh, 1997, I suddenly had to have heart surgery. I almost dropped dead on the street in downtown Washington the day before I had it. And uh, I was out of work for six weeks. That surgery today keeps you out of work for a week and a half, maybe. But back then, it was still a bit experimental. <clears throat> So I had to spend six weeks at home. And <laughs> during those six weeks, I wrote a cover story for the health section of the post. And the, the cover diagram showed a man in a chair with ropes tying him back like this. <laughs> that was pretty accurate because I'm a real type A work hard guy. And it was killing me to be home doing nothing, petting the cat, trying to read. Ah. So finally, after six weeks, I could go back and it's a Monday morning. And I decided to go in at six o'clock in the morning because I knew there'd be a ton of stuff to catch up on mail and this and that. It's about 6.20 in the morning. There's nobody there. I'm going through my stuff and I became aware of somebody behind me. And I looked around, it's Catherine Graham at 6.20 in the morning. 
Just wanted to see how you're doing, she said. Man, you think I'm ever going to forget that moment? I will not, and I have not. She did have a real heart. The Post is uh, a lot different now than it was then. The Grahams sold their interest in the Post uh, nearly eight years ago. Uh, they have no more uh, say in it, uh, although the editorial page uh, remains pretty much the way it was. The end came for me very suddenly because uh, I was in my 37th year at the Post and one day I was writing just another column and into my office comes the assistant managing editor and he says with a stack of papers like this and he said, you really better read this. And it was the buyout offer. <clears throat> The Post has since uh, done five more of these. The staff has shrunk from uh, more than 1,000 to fewer than 400. The Post is losing money, and it has been losing money steadily for 10 years. Uh, the Post is being kept alive, as I'm sure many of you know, by the richest man in the world, Jeff Bezos, who bought it uh, nearly eight years ago. But in my case, this just could not have come at a worse time. I didn't want to leave. <laughs> Why would I leave? I had a great job and it was going fine. And uh, But there I was, 58 years old. I had one in college. We had another one about to go to college. Oh my gosh. But we talked about it and talked about it and talked about it. And I finally decided to take this offer and go find something else to do. And I'm happy to say that in these uh, 17 years, I've done many, many things. <clears throat> I've been a professor at six universities, as Melissa told you. I was a senior vice president at the largest hospital in Washington. I've run two nonprofit organizations. I've run a consulting business. And I continue to write all the time, not just my boy Larry Felder candidate here, but I've written other books and many other magazine pieces. But <clears throat> I thought I was done with the Post and daily journalism forever. I've been gone about three weeks and my phone rings one day <laughs> and it's the obituary editor of the post, a guy I knew. And I said, hi, it's good to hear from you, but why are you calling? Uh, you, haven't I been looking good lately? Uh, is something wrong? <laughs> he said, no, 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 nothing like that. He said he had a proposition for me. He said that night they had been, uh, they'd gotten the word that Jimmy Carter had got, gone into the hospital. This is 17 years ago. And they looked around, looked around, they had nothing ready to go on Jimmy Carter. And it really, um, really would not have been good to uh, have a former president die on deadline and you have nothing ready to publish, uh, you'd be embarrassed. So the guy said, we found some money and we wanna hire a bunch of fossils like you to do advance obituaries about famous people. And they'd sit in the can until that awful day. And would you be interested? I said, yeah, I've been doing it ever since, folks. I am now in my 17th year of writing advance obits for the Post. I think I've done 42 of them, something like that. And these are people you know. These are people you voted for, people you voted against, people you've seen on TV, athletes, that kind of person. But here's the amazing part. Of those 42, only four of mine have died. <laughs> so my daughter wants me to get new business cards that say, if you want to live forever, have Levy write your obituary. <laughs> well, I'm not quite ready to promise that. But this has been, in some ways, the most interesting and weird assignment I've ever had, because I still am uh, asked to speak around the community and I do a lot of uh, events around the community, not so much since the pandemic, but uh, before that. And very often I'd had this wild experience of walking into a hotel ballroom, black tie, I'm gonna be the MC, And I walk in and I see across the room, someone whose obituary I did 10 years ago. Now he doesn't know it, but I know it. So I always do it the same way. I walk over to the guy and I say, Senator, how are you, sir? It's good to see you. And he'll shake my hand back when we were shaking hands. And he'll say, Bob, I'm good. It's good to see you. And then I'll say, you feeling OK? <laughs> Just my little private joke with myself. If you've always wondered who wins battles at a newspaper, and this goes on in Larry Felder candidate all the time, 
The answer is the editors, but sometimes their decisions are just a little bit out there. I want to tell you uh, two more stories uh, about that, and uh, then I'm going to open the floor for questions. One of the four of mine who died was a wonderful congressman from Peoria, Illinois, whom some of you may remember. His name was Bob Michael, and he was the Republican leader in the House for a long time, I think for 16 years. Bob Michael in some ways had uh, the perfect American life. He born and raised on a farm in Peoria, went abroad uh, during World War II, Purple Heart, came home, married the local girl, worked for the local congressman, became the local congressman. This guy was so great and so nice. On all of my radio shows, I would have him as a guest and he was always the best guest, just so good. Bob Michael had, uh, incidentally, uh, a very good bass baritone singing voice. And one day uh, in the middle of his time as the House Minority Leader, he was down in the well of the house where we, uh, if you were watching TV yesterday, where they were counting the impeachment votes right there. And he's doing the business of the free world and he looks up into the gallery. If, if any of you ever been in the house gallery, it's very small. It looks huge during uh, TV and during the State of the Union. It's very small. It's easy to see who's up there. So Michael happens to look in the visitor's gallery and guess who's up there? Bob Hope. So Bob Michael loosens up his voice. He stops everything and he looks up there and he sings to Bob Hope, thanks for the memories. Now, how cool is that? Uh, you'd have to be dead and buried yourself not to put that in the obituary of Bob Michael, which I did, and they took it out. They took it out. They oh, no, we've got to write a Newt Gingrich and this bill and that bill and Republican this and Democrat. We've got to take it seriously. So we argued for about six minutes, and uh, as usual, the editors won. But I passed that story along to you because you never read it in the post at the time, and you'll never read it now. And then I want you to come with me on this last one about how editors and reporters sometimes clash because this one I thought uh, was a perfect example of how it's never clear who wins and who ought to win. A couple of months ago, the editor called me with my latest assignment. Oh, and by the way, I don't ask to do certain people. They assign me. I am not doing Donald Trump. I am not doing Bob Levy. I am not doing Joe Biden. They assign me to do people. And I'm not allowed to tell you who I've done and who I'm doing, but I'm gonna break that promise right now because this story will not make any sense unless I tell you. They assigned me to do a singer named Tom Jones, whom some of you may remember. He was a big deal uh, in the 60s and 70s. Remember, tight blue jeans? It's not unusual. Remember him? Yeah. Well, I never really knew Tom Jones, and uh, I started on the obit the way all of you would. I listened to about three hours of his music, and I came to the unmistakable conclusion that Tom Jones can not sing. Oh, and I forgot to mention that the editor, when he gave me that assignment, said, Bob, you've been doing great work on this stuff, but I want you to let your belt out a little bit, write a little more from from passion, swing from the heels, he said. Write the heck out of it, he said. I said, okay, cool. So I'm listening to Tom Jones and I'm thinking, what, this guy can't be? I hope I'm not stepping on toes here. If there are any Tom Jones fans here, I, please forgive me, but uh, I am the co-producer of two professional singers, both of whom, by the way, got their start in summer dinner theater at Montgomery College in Rockville, Maryland. And uh, both of whom have taught me what good singing is and bad singing is. And one of the things that distinguishes a bad singer is that he or she does something called scooping. And here's an example of that. Tom Jones made a zillion bucks recording a song called The Green, Green Grass of Home. I'm sure some of you know this song. Joan Baez did it, Charlie Pride did it, Porter Wagner did it, Dolly Parton did it, they all did it. But when Tom Jones did it, he did it like this. The old, old town looks the same. I stepped down. He scooped up to the note that he wanted to sing. So 
Bearing in mind what the editor had told me, I wrote the following paragraph in that obit. I can't believe I did this, but I did. Remember he told me to swing from the heels and write the heck out of it? I wrote this. Tom Jones is one of three male entertainers to have a highly successful career in the 20th century without being able to sing, period. The other two were Rex Harrison and Willie Nelson, period. <laughs> and I hit sin. Well, if I were in front of you folks face to face, and I'm sorry I'm not, uh, this would be the time when I would go around the room and we would play the prices right. And I would ask you to guess without going over how many minutes it took for the obituary editor to call me. And there are all these guesses, you know, 10 minutes, 15 minutes, no minutes. The answer was six minutes. And for this guy, that was fast. Bob, we can't say this. Well, what do you mean we can't say this? Bob, we can't say, you told me to let my belt up. You can't say back forth, back forth. Well, folks, Tom Jones is back in his native Wales with his umpty umph wife uh, counting his millions. He's still alive. And one of these days uh, he will die and several things will happen on that day. One, my obituary will appear with my byline. Two, my phone will go crazy with people calling and saying, are you back? Are you back? Are you back? Well, I'm not back. I, it's kind of like being queen for a day. You know, my obituary will be up there for a day and then I'll just have to wait for somebody else to die. But now folks, as a public service, I have told you when you read that obituary someday, you now know the one paragraph that you will not read that day because the editors always win, always. Thank you so much, everybody. Again, it's my pleasure to be with you because you're my neighbors and I really look forward to uh, having you uh, take a look on my sales website for copies of Larry Felder Candidate. Let me tell you how to do that if you'd be interested. It's www.boblevypublishing.com. Boblevypublishing.com. And if you'd like your copy or copy signed, I'll be happy to do that. The good news is that I live uh, right next to a post office, right next to it. So I can get it right in the mail to you right away. And all of the information is right there on that website. Uh, I think the book would make a real good uh, read in the pandemic. It would make a great gift. Uh, knock yourselves out. It will not be on Kindle to those who just asked me that on the chat. I'm sorry about that. It just is so expensive to make a book on Kindle that I didn't do it. It's only uh, the print copy or copies. So boblevypublishing.com. Okay, Melissa, do you want to supervise the questions? Please do if you would. And sure. uh, I'm happy um, to answer anything. Sure. So does anybody want to start off with a question? Just. Yeah, Dennis here. I've got a question. Uh, yes, Bob, sir. What, what's your take on uh, the state of uh, journalism as a profession? It's a great profession. It will always be a great profession. But if you're interested in a career like mine <clears throat> with one major newspaper, that almost cer certainly is not going to happen. It's hard for a lot of people to understand this, but the internet has roiled this business so totally that uh, it's just impossible to, to talk about a career arc anymore. In my day, it was easy. You start at a small paper, you go to a medium-sized paper, you go to a big paper. I stepped over the middle step, but that's what we all did. Today, uh, you're gonna have to be good at a lot of things. You're gonna have to be ready to apply your trade on every one of them. Uh, you're gonna have to look like some of those folk singers back in the day. You remember them uh, who, who uh, had a guitar and a mouth rack with a harmonica and a set of drums and they're doing all three at the same time and sometimes singing at the same time. That's what journalism careers are gonna look like. They kind of do already. You're gonna have to know how to do websites. You're gonna have to know how to do voice stuff. You're gonna have to know how to shoot video. And oh yeah, you're gonna have to know how to report and write. So in terms of a career, it's very, very challenging, much more than ever. And if you're asking, sir, about the business, oh my gosh. I mean, 1,700 newspapers have gone out of business in the United States in just the last 10 years. 
and more will follow. There is no such thing anymore except for two uh, cities in the U.S. with more than one newspaper. It's a really, really a shame because I think we need well-edited, well-reported, well-curated news coverage more than ever. Bob? Yes. Uh, did you live in the Bronx when uh, Jimmy Carter went to Charlotte Street? No, no, I didn't. I lived in the Bronx when I was a little boy in the 1950s. And okay. then, uh, well, that was at Grand Concourse. Then we, I kind of followed my parents up the line. We, we lived for a time right near Yankee Stadium, if you know where that is. Oh, yes. Uh, Yankee Stadium, Grand Concourse, then Mashaloop Parkway, and then uh, we ended up for the last couple of years in Riverdale as they continue to make more and more money or thought they did. <laughs> and then I left and uh, I've never lived in New York again. Well, it's an interesting story. If you want to check out Jimmy Carter going to the Bronx, Charlotte Street, it was all burnt down. He's never knew there was a place like that in America. Yeah. This is when he was president? Yes. Okay, I'll check it out. Thank you very much. More questions, anybody? Not so much a question as an observation. There seem to be so many more women journalists on the Washington Post, people like Monica Hess and Margaret Sullivan and Teresa Vargas that do a lot of the human interest things. What's your opinion of this? I think it's great. When I started at the Post in 1967, there were four, count them, four women on the staff. Not for 10 years did a woman actually run any section at the Post, not till almost 1980. Not till 1999 was a woman the uh, managing editor. So it's been a slow progression, but today uh, almost half the staff is female. Uh, uh, three of six assistant managing editors are female. There still has not been a female editor, but I know that day is coming. And in a way this doesn't matter and shouldn't matter because it's all about being a professional. On the other hand, I did my column for a very long time. And for the last five years, I did my column. Each day, it was edited in sequence by four women. It, that was kind of, we used to joke about this. It was like a water purification plant. You know, my, my brilliant words would trickle down through one editor to two to three to four. And by the time it got down here, maybe it was drinkable, maybe. I thought these editors were great. Uh, there's no question there's a huge horizon for women in the business now. You just mentioned uh, a columnist. You didn't mention Petula Dvorak. You didn't mention Karen Tumulty. There are many, many more. Ro Ruth Marcus's columns on the uh, editorial page, I think are super. Uh, pretty soon, uh, as with many other professions, you know, like law school, medical school, business school, all three of those, the the preponderance of the students are women now. So it won't be long before the Post and other big newspapers have a preponderance of female editors too. Do you think that the tagline that Bezos gave to the Post will change now that there's a different president? No, I don't. Because uh, democracy still could die in darkness. Uh, and. Uh, Let's just say delicately that I think this uh, president's, uh, this president's uh, legacy will go on for a very, very long time. And I think there still will be threats to democracy for a very long time, so no. Other questions? Um, I have one, How, what was your, um either your favorite column or your favorite period of time oh. that you about. Oh, there's no time. favorite period of time. They were all great for one reason or another. Oh, my favorite column, gee, let me see, let me see. Or the most challenging. Oh, well, they, they were probably one and the same. Uh, <laughs> let me just think for a minute. I think the one that I will always remember because I think it changed the most things. And this, this may strike you, Melissa, as a, as a dumb answer, but it isn't. Because I think this actually made more change than any other column I ever wrote. Once again, it's a giant food story. 
Our daughter had just been born. This is the early 80s. <clears throat> you know what it's like with a young kid at home. And one day on a Saturday afternoon, we ran out of something and I had to make an emergency run to the local giant. And I'm in my very best sloppy t-shirt and my very best shorts and my very best sneakers. And I get, I'm ready to go and I get up to the front of the store and you know how there's always one line on the left that says 15 items or fewer here. You go in that line to get out quickly. Well, I chose it and then I looked at the sign over there and it said 15 items or less. Now, I did not suffer through one of the most uh, august universities in the world majoring in English without knowing that it should have been fewer, 15 items or fewer. So next Monday, I'm at work and I write a column, French frying giant food for not knowing the difference between less and fewer, right? Giant food on its own spent 1 million bucks, Melissa, to change that sign in every one of the giant foods from New Jersey to North Carolina. So here's that muscle, right? Yeah. Power of the press. I think that's the, the, that's the column that changed the most. Uh, I, I, still, I still remember that one and the reaction to it. Wow. Awesome. Other I have questions, a question. Folks? I have a question. Yes. Bob, you said you, they assigned you to write, by the way, first of all, let me just say how much I loved your column. And oh, I'm so sad. You. I was so sad when you retired because I was like, what about Well, as Bob? I've you explained, I, I didn't retire. I was basically uh, ushered <clears throat> you were out. out. But, okay, yeah. you, bought, you were bought out, whatever. I'm sad you, were, you stopped. But um, so you said that you write these obituaries that they assign you before the person has died. Yes, long before. And the person could live another 10 or 15 years or maybe 20 often does. Do they ask you to update the obituary? All the time. What happens there is that family situations change. Sometimes marriages end and begin. Uh, sometimes careers continue. I'm not going to name this person, but uh, since I wrote his obituary uh, 15 years ago, he has, he's now two more wives down the line. He's two more careers down the line. So you never write this and assume it's done because often it is not. Oh, and then the second, the follow-up question is, do these people know that you've written their obituaries? No, because it might make them a little know. nervous. Part of the rule is we never tell the person that we're writing about him or her. <clears throat> we just hope it doesn't leak. Uh, what we do is report around the person through friends or business associates or, uh, or colleagues. Uh, and so far it's, it's held up pretty well. Mm. Any, any stories about Charles Krathammer? Any uh, interactions with Charles? No, because believe it or not, I never met him. Charles wrote from home and I wrote from downtown and he was a syndicated columnist, but he was independent. He was uh, never, he never an employee of the Post. So I wish I did, but no, I don't. Who are the papers that the, who are the paper sets the culture for whether you're a liberal or a progressive or conservative type paper. Could you start that again? I didn't hear the beginning of it. Yeah. Who, who, who in a paper would set the culture for whether you're liberal or conservative or progressive? Well, or on many papers, uh, it would be the publisher, but the good news about Catherine Graham and her son Don later is that they never did that. The editorial page at the Post and at every newspaper speaks for the publisher, but Good publishers know that they should get out of the way and let the professionals do it. If a tone was set on the post, uh, it was would have been set by the Grahams, but it really was not. Uh, the post is often criticized for its liberal editorial page, but that's easy to point out that there are, it's easy to point out that there are holes in that. Uh, the Post uh, was the last major American newspaper to change its view about the war in Vietnam. It was still uh, saying, let's go win the war as late as 1968. Uh, the Post has been extremely conservative about fiscal policy. It's true that the Post does endorse more Democratic candidates than Republicans. That is true. But in terms of the word coming down, sir, about thou shalt be conservative or thou shalt be liberal, it doesn't work like that. Uh, each editorial and the overall vision of the paper is is, uh, is really a day-to-day -day question. 
Bob, uh, I've got a, a couple comments. One, I want to thank you for the service that you provide uh, and continue to provide, like being on the board at Montgomery College, where I had the privilege of serving when your daughters was there. Well, I know that, Gene, and uh, we miss you. And uh, MC is just a fabulous, fabulous place. And I, it's but, just constantly amazing to me uh, that it isn't being more overrun with students because it really is that good. That's right. I, uh, and, and I go back to the 60s in Montgomery County. So I'm a, a Bob Levy fan from way back. But I, I didn't know that you were doing the obits, and I've got a suggestion that do with it as you please. But you're probably better qualified than anybody else because the person I'm going to recommend has been in the news for the last 50 years in our area. And I think it'd be kind of, you'd have kind of fun writing his obit. And that is the person that is known as Robin Ficker. <laughs> Don't worry. Well, I can't, I, Gene, I cannot tell you who we've done as I, and unless yeah. I'm going to break my promise with Tom Jones. Uh, <laughs> Don't worry, Gene, you're going to get your wish. Uh, can I just tell, I'll, I'll just say it that way. You're going to get okay, your wish. Okay, well, you know, he was actually responsible for me running for elected office. He was my delegate, and I decided that you know, I would become the Ficker kicker. <laughs> <laughs> anyway. Anyway, thank you. That's great. And Gene, I hope you're doing well. I miss you and we all miss you. Thank you. Um, Bob, I'm, I was wondering, have you noticed an increasing trend and more editorializing on the new side of newspapers? Yes, I have, sir. And the reason is the internet. Uh, it isn't as simple as saying, You've got to you've got to write super attractively and super out there in order to attract attention, but that is becoming more true than false. And let me explain it this way: This is now pretty much an internet business. Uh, the Washington Post has an average uh, an average uh, circulation online every month of about 60 million people. That is just huge. That makes it one of the largest. Uh, uh, website traffic sites in the world. 60 million versus uh, what the newspaper used to have uh, at its height, the most it ever had was about 800,000. That's daily, little more than a million Sunday. So <laughs> the game on the web and the game from a business point of view is you've got to attract eyeballs or clicks. And if I took you right now into the newsroom at the Washington Post, which by the way, has been closed for 10 months, I couldn't take you there. But if I could, you'd walk into the main newsroom and the first thing you would see would be a great big tote board about, oh, maybe 50 feet long and 12 feet high, flashing green lights, blue lights, yellow lights, changing all the time. And this would be the up to the second tally of which stories are attracting the most clicks on WashingtonPost.com. You can see where this could lead. Uh, for example, I, I, sorry for the long answer, but it's important you understand this, that you can set your phone uh, to alert you uh, anytime WashingtonPost.com carries a story that is of interest to you in any way. So let's say that, the, that you were really interested in uh, in uh, Jerry Lewis. And Bob Levy, you're, you're covering the, the talk I just gave and you wrote a story and it said, Bob Levy spoke before the Poolsville Senior Group on, uh, on uh, Thursday night, uh, January 13th, comma, and Jerry Lewis was not there. <laughs> well, you'd never write that, but if you did, and you, if your phone were pre-programmed to get you to every Jerry Lewis mention, then I would get a click from you. And that could affect my future assignments, my career arc, merit raises, salary, if I were cynical about it. But uh, you know, there's been a lot of uh, bad about the internet and this is one of the bad things that it's so easy just to say that it's a game of clicks and money now. It isn't, it shouldn't be, but more and more there is pressure on 
smaller newspapers and smaller sites uh, that just aren't going to be able to make it financially if they don't get clicks. Mm -hmm. wow. All right, anybody else? Speak up now. Speak well, now. I want to know who did those fabulous paintings behind you. Oh, uh, well, Jean Cunahan will remember this person. Her name is Bobby Shulman. Oh, my gosh, of course. You know Bobby Shulman? Of course. I thought they looked familiar. Yeah. Bobby is an old friend and a brilliant artist. Yep. And uh, uh, her husband, uh, Larry, uh, came with her when Jane and I bought these two from her studio. And Larry Shulman, senior partner in a great big Montgomery County law firm. You see it right there on 270 when you go up 270. It, it's right on that building there, Shulman mm -hmm. Rogers. Larry Shulman, like a good obedient soul, came in and he's the one who nailed up the little thing that holds these, these paintings here. I love uh, it. Bobby Shulman is tremendously good at this. And yeah. uh, all of the Zooms that I do are right in front of her two, two portraits here. And, uh, People ask about it all the time. They're great. Bob, did you Somebody have the opportunity? Bob, I'm sorry? The opportunity to travel on assignment? Well, not that much. I mean, the one thing I never did, sir, was a foreign assignment. I did travel a lot within the United States uh, on various assignments of one kind or another. <clears throat> I traveled all the time when I was in sports because you had to do it. In 1973 and 74, I covered the NBA team here in Washington, then known as the Bullets, and I traveled all over the country with them all the time. And I, I led the league in washing out my underwear in hotel sinks. <laughs> that was, you know, I, I look back on that year of, uh, and I just think that in some ways was the most amazing year I ever spent. I just. In those days, this isn't true now, but the, the pro basketball teams would fly commercial. And mm -hmm. let's say we played in Chicago on a Monday night, and then we were scheduled to play in, in Kansas City on a Wednesday night. The league rules said you had to get there at least 36 hours ahead of the game because they were worried about snow and cancellation. So we'd always have to fly out at 6 a.m. the next day, you know, having gotten about four hours sleep. So there we are in the departure lounge at O'Hare Airport, and there's me and a couple of other people, and there are 12 people who are all seven feet tall, and they're all lounging, you know, like this in their seats, and everybody's exhausted, and there's some little old lady over there who's looking at us, looking at us, looking at us. She can't stand it anymore. She would come over and say, I know you boys must be basketball players. And then one guy on the team would say, oh, no, oh, ma'am, no, we work in a circus. We're the we're the dumb guys. And he got these little old ladies going and all the guys are laughing like this. And anyway, it, that was one thing. There were many things about that year. But boy, oh, boy, does that cure you from any desire to fly again or be in a motel again. Uh, that year just did me. Uh, I've done it many times since, but uh, there's no romance to it anymore. Any other Bob, questions or anybody? Bob, it's really surprising to me to hear you say that the reason that they wanted them to be there 36 hours in advance was because of snow and all that. Yeah. I always thought it was because they wanted the players to have plenty of rest. No, I'm oh, shocked no. to hear that it was not oh, about no. the players. The it NBA is, is a big, game. big business. Uh, I don't know exactly. It's bigger than a billion dollars a year now. It's it's the world's most lucrative business. I don't know why NFL. I should be surprised to hear that it was not about the players. And it, it was, was more never about, about the, the, the players. Uh, they, they couldn't have cared less about that. They just didn't <laughs> want to have to refund 10,000 tickets in Kansas City. Uh, you know, we had, some, we had some bumpy plane rides in a lot of snowstorms. Another illusion shattered. No, no, don't, no, no, not an illusion shattered. It's, this is the way a lot of businesses work. So there it is. Who else? Anybody else? All right. Well, I, if we have no other questions, we're going to let Bob go. This has been so fantastic and so entertaining. Thank you, and everybody. If you have ever have more to talk about, you just call me 
you are welcome to come back anytime. Well, you, you, obviously, I'm just scratching the surface here, and I could go on for a very long time. And if you want to have me back sometime, uh, I'll be glad to come. And before I go, uh, one more shot on uh, my boy here, Larry Felder, candidate, and uh, BobLevyPublishing.com. And as we as used good. to say when I was a kid, operators are standing by. <laughs> Mr. Levy, you're missed in the post. Thank you. Uh, of my whole family followed your co uh, column, and uh, it's just a joy to be able to hear your voice, which I feel like I'm kind of reading columns again because you talk, you're, you, 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 it's like, uh, listening to your column live. Well, you're, you're very you. kind. And, you know, a lot of people, uh, a lot of people are surprised to hear what you heard at the very beginning that, uh, that my, my, uh, my voice uh, has also been a, a revenue stream for me. I, as uh, Melissa told you, I worked for nine radio stations in the 70s, 80s, and 90s. And uh, just to uh, take myself down a peg, I worked at WTOP three different times. Mm. And uh, the last, and, and each time I left in a friendly way, but the last time I was leaving, uh, this is maybe what, 15 years ago, something like that. Yeah, Bob Levy Publishing is the place to get the book. Yes, you can get it on Amazon, but please don't because I make way more money if you order it directly from me. Way more. Please order it from Bob Levy Publishing. So I'm leaving WTOP for the last time and uh, the, the big boss says, you know, Bob, no one ever said the big slogan on WTOP as well as you did. I said, really? He said, can I hear it just one more time? So I gave it to him. Ready? Traffic and weather together on the eights. We'll be right back after this. Hey. <laughs> the, guy, the guy says, look, can I, can I record you saying that? And I said, okay. And I never asked him for a dime. That's how dumb I am. And they used my little bump, the, what I just said to you, for the next 12 years. <laughs> Daytime, nighttime, Saturday, Sunday. I could have made millions. <laughs> <laughs> Didn't do it. Didn't do it. <laughs> anyway, uh, uh, Melissa, if you'd like to have me back sometime, I'd be happy to come. And uh, I, uh, I do expect to publish at least one more novel. And I've, I've got two written now that are, wow, that are doing awesome. the rounds in New York. So Thanks. maybe we can do it. Yeah, and I can't wait to read this one, and I may even suggest it to our book club. Oh, listen, I'm happy to do book clubs, and uh, all of you, uh, I'm happy to do any other organizations that you think might be interested in me. This, this means uh, church groups, synagogue groups, uh, whatever. You, you know what your groups are, and I'd be happy sure. to meet with you, especially since we're all in Zoom jail here all the time. Mm -hmm. Even a small sure. one, yes, sure. Yes. <laughs> I don't know how many we. Um, and just for those of you who know, we're starting one through the senior center also. Oh. Meeting the first, the, I mean, the fourth Monday of the month. The so 25th. Carol, if you're interested in joining another one, uh -huh. just check out our website. And we'll be, this will be our first month. And so we'll be choosing books. So I'm going to suggest yours. Please do. That would be great. And again, whoever said uh, on the chat here, I just got a quick look. Please, please, please don't make Amazon any richer than they are. Uh, <laughs> Bezos is richer than I am, and I'm trying to catch up, and you got to help me, okay? <laughs> well, and the thing is, if it goes, if we go through you, you'll sign it for That's us. correct, and that will not happen if you order it from Amazon. Exactly. Exactly. Well, Bob, thank you so much. This has been just a great Family. Thank you to all of you. And it's, as I said at the very beginning, it's really fun to be with neighbors and uh, keep going out there in Poolsville, okay? Keep it up. Thank you so much. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you. Thanks, everybody.